Lord Lieutenant, the Archbishop of York, Mrs. Centineau, High Sheriff, Lord Mayor, Sir Mark Elder, Federico Colley, distinguished guests. Uh, one of my friends, I'm sorry, didn't make it. That was Baroness Deitch, who is a very formidable lady in the House of Lords. I believe the Archbishop knows her. And uh, unfortunately, there's an illness in the family just a few days ago. But she will come up to the competition. Thank you very much. I was told yesterday by a friend of mine um, about making speeches. He said, you have to stand, you have to speak, and then you have to shut up. <laughs> I think that's probably what you're all hoping for now. But I'm sorry, I have got a few things to say. Um, we're immensely grateful to the Archbishop for coming and actually staying so late. I gather he comes late and goes early, but tonight I believe he came later and you're going late. Thank you, and Mrs. Centineau is absolutely great. And I do hope you've enjoyed this special occasion as much as I have done when you received me at Bishop Thorpe and the Minster. I felt straight away that we had bonded. And I must tell you that uh, I had an idea when I had my musical evenings that I should like the Archbishop and Mrs. Centineau. And I was afraid to ring. And then Richard said, ring him, you can only ask. And he came and we had a competition uh, where someone played music and the Archbishop got nine out of 10. And he's never got over that. And so we're going to have another musical evening for you. Um, now, our competition, I'll tell you a bit of the history of it. It started with a sleepless night when I said to my darling husband, Geoffrey, I'd like to have a competition, an international one in Leeds. He came from London and he said, it won't work in Leeds, it has to be in a capital city. So he turned over and as soon as I got up in the morning, I rang Marion Harwood, who was my greatest friend. I suppose you all know that she's died a few weeks ago. And uh, when I wake up or think of something, I think, oh, I'll ring Marion and see what she thinks. And she's not there. So I'm really very sad. And I know Mark would like me to have said a few words about her, but I felt on this occasion that I would cry. But I have written an article about her in the programme because she was a great woman, beautiful, but she had a wonderful soul. And her place in Orm Square, where she lived, was the kind of magnet for all the great musicians of the world I met there. Giulini and Tito Gobbi and Marie Callas and Annie Fisher and Benjamin Britten and Peter Pierce. And she was a marvelous hostess. It started off with a lovely fairy story and then it didn't end that way because she finished her life in a wheelchair. So I'm telling you about our competition started with Marion, Geoffrey, the headmaster of the Leeds Grammar School, the vicar of Leeds, and um, I think there was a retired uh, treasurer. And he didn't know very much about music. And I think my husband was proofreading it. And he rang up and said, Jeffrey, I don't know about music, but did Beethoven write an erotica symphony? <laughs> so, uh, I'd like to turn the clock back now and remember the great people, not only the ones whom I've had the privilege to meet in my long life, but also the people associated closely with our competition. Our first chairman was Sir Arthur Bliss, first chairman and master of the Queen's Music. I remember having lunch with him at Marion's and he'd been at the Tchaikovsky and I think they have about 120 entrants. And he said to us both, I hope you're not going to have as many as that. And we said, certainly not. But when I tell you, we invited 98. But 
Anyway, he didn't mind. Now, the other great person in my life was Lord Boyle. Hands up anyone who remembers Lord Boyle. You do. Well, he was a great man. He was a marvellous politician, Minister of Education, Vice Chancellor of the University of Leeds, and he was a great musician. He would know everybody's not opus numbers, or he and Jeffrey, who also had a good brain, they'd be discussing the cricket team in 1930. They had that kind of a brain that they never forgot anything. And one of my great wishes in the world is that if I were born again, I'd love to have a good memory. It really helps you through life. Now, there was Benjamin Britten. He came and sat, sandwiched in between Marion and myself, and he was so impressed with the running of the competition that he offered to do a composition for us. That's the Notturno. And we set that every year for the competitors' play. Nadia Boulanger. Have all of you heard of Nadia Boulanger? She was the queen of world music. She taught Ravel and Stravinsky. Everybody went to her. And I had the audacity to write to her and say, would she be a guest of honour? And she wrote back and she said, no, but if you invite me, I'd like to serve on the jury on one condition, that is when the jury go in to vote, there is no discussion. And she's absolutely right. It's different from the law where your jury have to come to some agreement with us. We don't want one to influence the other. I've been on more than 100 juries and there's no one as clean as our competition. Um, the kind of thing they'll say, I'll vote for your pupil if you vote for mine. There's all this going on, and I feel very sorry for the competitors. They know about it now, but the reason we get our wonderful entry is because no one can say a bad word about the competition. They might not agree, but there's none of this kind of background that's going on. So... Then there was Dame Janet Baker, from whom I learnt about respiration. When you hear her sing, instead of her running one line into another, there's a wonderful breath as she goes from one line to another in the Schubert songs. And in those short songs, she takes you through life in the winterizer, from your very long life until death. And when you hear her sing that, it is something remarkable. I think you will agree with me, Mark, don't you, about Janet being one of the greatest mezzo-sopranos in the world. Um, of course, the Simon, uh, who conducted, and, of course, now we've got Mark Elder, whom, in my opinion, is not only one of the greatest conductors in the world, but I can think of no one I prefer to listen to the Mark Elder and what he's done with that Holy Orchestra. This is world class. And when we get some of these other orchestras in Leeds who happen to play Tchaikovsky and all that kind of thing, and they get a lot of applause, and I grumble about it in the interval, they say, but the audience liked it. I said, the audience liked it when Marie Antoinette's head was cut off. <laughs> <laughs> So, I like to be with people like Mark and Peter on our own, Leon McFawley, people who really know and suffer for the music and understand what is involved, not judge people by the amount of applause. That's what the BBC are doing now. They're dumbing us down. Having that little grumble, I'll go on to 50 years later, where we are today. And the international community of the world all say ours is the greatest piano competition in the world because of its integrity, because of the wonderful engagements we offer. We used to have a set repertoire in those days, and it's more like a family. Tells a woman runs this uh, university, um, Devonshire Hall, 
and they all loved her, so she loves them. And it's more like a big party, and there's no feeling of rivalry between them. I always go down the night before, take biscuits for the volunteers, and there's a marvellous atmosphere there. So, so long as we get the good competitors, our competition will live forever. A competition depends on the competitors. I've recently been in Hong Kong, and Ashkenazi's chairman of a big competition there. And I happened to see in the paper that they're allowing competitors to enter later because they haven't got enough people. Now, I should hate that to happen to us because we can do all this work and get this money from all of you. But if we don't get the caliber of competitors, we'll go down and we'll become a mediocre competition. And I'm determined that that will not happen. Of course, uh, the city of Leeds is very proud of us because they all say that we put Leeds on the map. Dennis Healy, former Lord Chancellor, on his first visit to Leeds, said he was the musical wonders of the world. Um, I think that the vision of the jury, who I invite because I work with them, it plays a big part in it. There's all different kinds of pianists in the world, and they're all marvellous. But I particularly go for, maybe you don't know them, the Schnabels, and that kind of player uh, who we've had, Murray Pariah, who takes us to heaven with his beautiful Mozart playing, or Anders Schiff, one of the greatest Bach pianists in the world who's recently become knighted, which is very unusual, I think, for a pianist to get a knight in this country. Anyway, the jury are absolutely marvellous, but the competitors have really made our competition. They, they carry the barra banner of the least competition in every concert hall of the world. You heard what Lang Lang said. He said, wherever he goes in the world, people talk about our competition. So I've told you about Murray, and Rado, it's a spiritual thing, Mitsuko Yoshida, and tonight we have here Peter Donahoe and Liam McCauley, also great pianists. And I'll tell a little story. <laughs> Thank you. My late teacher was called Cyril Smith, and he was practicing in the concert hall, empty, because he was going to play Rachmaninoff third piano concerto in the evening. And he was so tired, he took his handkerchief off and he wiped his brow. And there were two cleaning ladies around, and one said to the other, that piano man, he hasn't done a decent day's work in his life. Peter, would you like to comment on Rack 3 and what you think of that? Where's Peter? Peter, can you just come a minute? Tell me what you think. I think you said after you played in Leeds, that's the last time you're playing Rack 3. <laughs> Tell me, Peter. Well, no, it never... It, it, I very often say it's the last time I'll, I'll play Rack 3, but it never is. It keeps <laughs> coming up and up and up. In you all want you. Yeah, yeah, well, I don't know. They, they like that piece, I guess. And nobody else can play it like you. You're very kind. Sir. Thank you. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Now, I must acknowledge the part played from our official partner, the BBC. They have broadcast this competition since 1962, I think. Oh, 66. Yes, John Drummond if you heard of him, he was the director of the Edinburgh Festival and a big um, musician with the BBC. And he came and visited Marion and I with his cap in his hand and said, I wonder if you would consider allowing us to televise the competition. And he left and I remember Marion, who was very modest, she said to me, we're two very important ladies. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the BBC now any competition is very happy to get the radio and, in fact, have to pay them. They pay us, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> now, Paul Bullock is uh, the one who does it. Um, oh, uh, by the way, John Drummond won an award 
Great Expectations. It's a wonderful title, and he won an international award. He lived for the competitors, and he did this marvellous documentary. Yeah. Now I'm on to Sir Mark Elder. I was just thinking the other day, this speech is getting rather long. I think I'd better cut, a, cut out a few people. And then I thought to Sir oh, Sir Mark is so nice. He's a personal friend. He won't mind if I say, Mark, do you mind not being the last speaker and not speaking? However, that's a joke. I've already, <laughs> I've already broken that idea to him. And of course, he's our guest of honour. And I want... Mark uh, to finish the night after I've spoken and what I like about Mark as a conductor and what he's done with that orchestra is how he gets to the souls of the composers you see it's not a matter of dynamics playing loud and soft and all the colours in between that when you're a performer you have to feel their distresses, their anxieties, their disappointments, because if you don't feel them, you cannot transfer them to an avenue of teaching or people. I do it with very young people. I say, tell me what you feel. And one said, I get angry. In the end, you can get them to say that and they play the piece again and it's different. And I don't think anybody does that finer with your singing strings. I've been and heard, Mark, your Eroica at the proms this year. And I must say, for me, it was the highlight of all these concerts that I hear from the proms. You walked with me to the Vienna Woods in some of the lilting mo music. We walked together because I know that Beethoven went to Schubert's funeral. And in that funeral march, it was so wonderful, the way you played it in C minor and the pacing of the walking. I went there with you in my imagination. And so I think this is so important for a conductor to know the whole repertoire, not just the concertos, but to know the quartet, to know everything about Beethoven and how he suffered. I heard the late quartets yesterday, and when I think that he had cancer, and he was unkempt and unloved, and had to go out from one dig to another, and he was deaf, what a tragedy. I think of that when I hear these works, and I just feel that it's something beyond expressing in words. Now, I've spoken about Mark as a conductor, but what about Mark as a communicator? Mark, you've got a wonderful vocabulary of words, uh, onomatopoeia words, and wonderful, rich vocabulary. So when you talk about music, say on the uh, BBC, you engage your listeners to understand as far as they can go. They can't go as far as you, but you're an educator. And I think that when they hear what you've been talking about again, they'll listen with different ears. Now, I think there are three domains in music. You'll get the parchment manuscripts, and they're only dots and dashes and little signs, but that's not music. If I get one of those, I'm not all that gifted to say, oh, yes, I can hear that music. So what we need is the second domain, and that is the great artists, the Horowitzes, the Rubensteins, the Kreisers, all those people who bring the music to life. The composers live in God's, in heaven, and when you get the combination of this musical performance that I get, and I tell Mark this over and over again, he's very modest, and I don't know if he believes me, but I say it sincerely in public, and I, you can have it in writing, uh, everyone, that I think there's no greater conductor in the world than Mark Elder. And so I think 
when I hear this, the heavens open out and you get a little lift and a little sight of heaven on earth. Thank you, Mark, for the wonderful work you do. But my last thing is you, the audience, because if you're not here, and the atmosphere was marvellous tonight, it was fun and we all enjoyed it, I think that music has only a past and no future. Because Mark and I would just be having a dinner together, wouldn't we, Mark? Thank you. <laughs> and nobody else there. So we'd have empty halls, poor box office. Next thing, the music club is closing down. So I think that it's very important that those three things are always in my mind. Um, I compare you to a great conductor and orchestra I heard many years ago, and probably none of you have heard, Bruno Walter and the Vienna Philharmonic. I can hear a yes. Yes. Now, I'll never forget that. I don't know if I was as musical then as I am now, but it was such a great occasion. And that's what I feel when Mark comes to Leeds. Thank you, Mark. And I know you're going to take over for me when I let you. <laughs> the next one is Federico Colley, our other guest of honour. Now, I think his Mozart was so beautiful. I could hear Mozart in Salzburg. It was typical Mozart. There was something of the operas there. And what about the Beethoven? Same thing I said about Mark's Beethoven. He really was treating those sonatas as symphonies to the piano. Right. Um, going back to Collie, you've got charm. You're a marvellous player. You've got to have stamina, and you've got good looks. And what about those colourful cravats? <laughs> We're all waiting to see what you're wearing tomorrow. Um, now, we're very grateful to you because you've come over and you've done this for nothing. And that means that you're very, very generous. So I want to thank you. And I was at his London recital with Mark. Where's Mark? Um, and Mark very kindly put on a little reception afterwards. And the audience was so quiet. As you were tonight, you could he hear each one breathing. But he had a standing ovation, and I think he deserved a standing ovation tonight. I think he's a great future ahead, and he's got marvellous engagements. But above everything, however well you play, there are other things come into life. You've got to have charm. You've got to learn to get on with the conductor. It's no use saying to the conductor, I want you to go slower there. You say, would it be possible? I prefer it to go slower. There's a way of communicating with people. And I think that he's got all that. But I warned him, and he agrees with me, that the competition of real life begins the day after you win the competition. When you are compared to the Horowitzes and all the great people, and the Peter Donohoes, and here we have them, uh, not only to the people who've been with you at Tetley Hall, and you're cast into the ocean, and you have to swim very hard to keep afloat. So he says he's quite mindful of that, he understood. So, um, I'd like to say that I'm happy that Robert is here with his two beautiful daughters and um, my friends from Hastings, Sarah and David Coberts, who run the Hastings competition. I went there and it is marvellous. A friend of mine, when I told her, she said, why Hastings? I said, why Leeds? Because there's somebody there who's passionate about young people and helping them, and they are passionate, and they're here today, and they've played a very important part, A, for coming up, and B, for their generosity. Now, all of us connected with the competition are really hoping that this competition can last forever, beyond all our lives, and 
we need financial security. And if any of you feel that in some way you can do something for us, I would be very happy. I have been very fortunate to have raised money for the first four competitions in sponsorship. And I found it very easy. I just had people down at my musical evenings and they said, how much do you want? And I said, how much you wanted? And they said, all right. Now, I want to say thank you to the great private sponsors. We have in this room Dr. Marjorie Ziff. The Ziff family have given a second prize for years and years and years. And what about Audrey and Stanley Burton? They were great philanthropists, not just for the music, but for medicine, for everything. And so are the Ziffs who give the university. And of course, we've got Terry Bramall and Dr. Keith Howard. And of course, we have other public things like the city of Leeds. So on that note, I would like to say thank you to everybody who supported this event, because it's not easy to come and I said to Tessa, I think it's far too expensive. But she said no. And I think Tessa has done a marvellous job on this. Yeah. And I would like Nick and um, Tessa. And where is Beverly? Is she here? Is she here? Nick. Can you come, Nick? I want to give you a personal thank you, Nick, because I think that you've got a future impresario uh, talent in you to put on this show. show. I think it's been marvellous. It's been like a military operation. And what can I say about Tulsa? I mean, she never answers my, uh, my phone calls. Because she, she knows they're going to be long and I'm going to be critical. But they've got used to me now. I am a perfectionist and I do want this competition to have the same dignity, profile and artistic integrity that it's always had. So I'd like Telsa and Nick to have a big handshake from all of you. Thank you so much. This event has been a triumph. Thank you.